So in the previous lecture we have seen these structures called fields right and we have seen what sort of properties they must satisfy. Before we move on to other topics let us just give you a couple of quick exercises to think about. Suppose we have a field, we have seen that you can have real numbers which satisfy the properties of field with the usual addition and multiplication. You have complex numbers, these are both examples nonetheless of infinite fields. However, you could also have examples of finite fields where n is prime, right, with the modulo operations. So I just ask you to check as part of an exercise that if you have a field like so where or rather a supposed field like so I should say where D is square free over F okay and F is a set that looks something like alpha plus beta square root d with alpha beta belonging to the field. So I urge you to verify if this is also going to be a field, okay. Where this of course inherits the addition and multiplication operation from the original f, okay. So you have alpha and beta which are members of the original field f and now I am taking up a new set that looks something like this and I am asking you to check if this set if it inherits the same multiplication and addition as defined in f is also a field, okay. So we will have a few more problems for you to solve in the problem sheet but it would be nice if you can try out this exercise before attempting that, okay. Try to convince yourself whether this, this is a field or otherwise, okay. That is one point. The second thing that I would like to point out is uh, also underscores the importance of why we studied fields but it will come in the second part of the course much later. You will see that with the eigenvalue eigenvector problem will come the associated problem of diagonalizability of a matrix which is to say that if I give you a matrix a square matrix which is let us say over a field n cross n. So that is basically n squared entries each of the entries coming from a field right. Can we write this in a diagonal form provided we pluck out so let us ask the question does there exist P also coming from F n cross n such that P inverse A P is this with being a diagonal matrix, okay. So this is an important question. It will not have a general answer unless I tell you what is, an, what is the A matrix that we have. Just to motivate this line of thought, let us take up an example and we shall see immediately where we could possibly run into trouble. So suppose A is just a 2 by 2 real matrix, okay. Let us say A is given by 0, 1, minus 1, 0, right. Suppose there exists P such that P inverse AP is diagonal for P being a two real by a uh, real 2 by 2 matrix, okay. So what is the potential problem that we might run into? Let us see. 
At each step we shall try to do some legitimate operations with matrices as you understand them. Now what we have been given is that P inverse AP is equal to some diagonal matrix, real diagonal matrix all right. That means this must be equal to some D1, 0, 0, D2 where D1 and D2 are real numbers right. Please ask if at any point you have any doubts, we will try to clarify. But now notice that what about P inverse AP, so observe that P inverse AP times P inverse AP is equal to the square of this diagonal matrix which is nothing but D1 squared 0, 0, D2 squared. But I can open up these brackets and what does, the res what does that result in? This P and P inverse in the middle will end up pulverizing each other into the identity by our very definition which means that I have P inverse A squared P is given by this, right. But what about A squared? What does A squared look like? So look closely at A squared. What does A squared look like? Quick guess, sorry, identity, sure. Is it the identity? No. Then? Mm, so skew symmetric, but what are the entries? Is it skew, is it skew symmetric? I doubt it. Negative of identity, absolutely. A squared is just the negative of identity, which is minus i. What does that tell us? What can we say about this then? This is P inverse. I can obviously say negative of identity means I can pull out the minus sign outside. So this is nothing but minus P inverse P is equal to D1 squared 0, 0, D2 squared. Is it not? In other words, I have, if you allow me to erase this part and continue from here on, this essentially means that I have minus 1, 0, 0, minus 1 is equal to D1 squared 0, 0, D2 squared. Does there exist real D1, D2 such that D1 squared is minus 1 and D2 squared is minus 1? Of course not, right? So if you are searching for diagonalizability over real matrices, then this matrix would fail to lead you to such a solution with some such P inverse AP. Now why this P inverse AP, why this particular form of diagonalization? That will be clearer when we deal with the eigenvalue eigenvector problem much later. But at least you understand that this problem is not solvable in general over any field. In fact, such fields have a special name over which we will see later. If you cook up polynomials whose coefficients are from a field such that the solutions of the polynomial must also belong to that field, such fields are called algebraically closed. It so happens that complex numbers, the field of complex numbers is algebraically closed, but the field of real numbers is not algebraically closed, all right? So therein lies the problem, okay? But there could be other reasons, several other reasons which would preclude diagonalization or diagonalizability of a matrix as we shall see much later again. So a lot of promises for later, but at least you understand hopefully that no matter whether we are looking for the second problem that is that of eigenvalue eigenvector or the first problem which is solving AX is equal to B, a deep understanding of the field with which we are dealing is very important, okay? So you must always specify what field you are working with and depending on that a lot of things would change. Whether this matrix is for instance diagonalizable or not rests on the question as to what is the field over which you are considering this matrix to be. Now notice the field of real numbers is a subfield of the field of complex numbers. So I might very well have said consider this to be a complex matrix, matrix in C2 cross 2 instead of R2 cross 2. In which case your answer as to whether this is diagonalizable would have changed completely. You would have said yes it is diagonalizable. There is no problem to diagonalizing it. If you allow me all sorts of complex values then of course you can have D1 and D2 
right as i the imaginary i and then it's it's there's nothing that prevents it of course how to find that p that is again something we'll find in the eigenvalue eigenvector problem and its solution right so therefore the field over which we are working is of paramount importance which one this is a big lambda all right so having convinced ourselves about the importance of this object that we've learnt in the previous class called fields let us move over to more important questions which allow us to abstract the sense of what we asked in the form of matrices let's take an example so suppose i have a function of time given by 2e to the minus 2t plus 5e to the minus 3t plus 7e to the 4t and f2 of t is equal to 6e to the minus 2t plus 4e to the minus uh, 3t plus 8e to the 4t and let's say f of t as given by 9e to the minus 2t plus 9e to the minus 3t plus 12e to the 4t okay suppose i give you these three functions and i ask the question as to whether this third function f of t is a linear combination of the first two functions okay so then you might ask this question in the following form can i write f of t is equal to c1 f1 t plus c2 f2 of t of course you should ask me what is the field over which you are taking this linear combination in other words this c1 and c2 let's say real numbers yeah so does there exist c1 c2 which are real numbers such that this is true and the important part the most important part that you mustn't miss here is for all t so you cannot possibly come up with some particular choice of c1 c2 and solve for some t and say oh hang on this is a solution for t no that solution must work for all t because otherwise it becomes like you're solving some equation in t that's not what i'm asking for okay it turns out that this question fits into the general framework what of what we've been trying to answer that is ax is equal to b once you see what's going on once you see the pattern once you see the similarity in order to view this problem by the same token as we have viewed ax is equal to b and its solution we need a more general structure okay i have motivated that in the previous lecture somewhat through a picture in the euclidean space in r3 where i said that look at this question where you have say this is x this is y this is z yeah and suppose you have a vector v1 here and another vector say v2 here and the question that i'm basically asking when i say that i'm asking you to solve for the following equation that is v1 v2 remember these are how many tuples these are in r3 so these are three tuples so when i write a matrix like this what is the size of this matrix 3 cross 2 right and i'm asking you to solve for this when this is the situation okay now of course you see the point that i'm making or the structure that i'm trying to show you here okay this is exactly what we've been dealing with so if you look at the column picture of ax is equal to b this is the kind of question we've been trying to address all along so can you write this third vector as a linear combination 
Now do you see the pattern of the question that we have been trying to answer? So in order to address all of this within some common framework, we are now going to define something important. Okay? For that, there are the following things that we need. What do we need? One, we need a field, say F. Okay. We need a set of so called vectors. Why I have put it in inverted commas is the fact that this is not the vector that you understand in physics with some magnitude and some direction. It is just a set of vectors. Okay. So we need the following objects in order to define what we are trying to define, which is we need a field first let us say it is F. We need a set of vectors, a collection of objects that we call vectors defined by the set V. We need an operation called the vector addition which maps two objects picked from the set of vectors to the set itself. Yeah. So such an operation which is an abelian group. Okay? What it means is it satisfies those properties that you take any two objects from that set of vectors, perform this addition, what you get back must also belong to that set which is the property of closure. It must also have associativity. So you take three objects, it does not matter in which order you add them. Okay? You can put the brackets in any way you like so that you can actually do away with the brackets without any loss of, um, uh, I mean, explanation or without any ambiguity. Third, you need an additive identity, right? So you need some zero element with respect to this addition operation such that which when added to any object in this set of vectors gives you back that same vector. You also need an additive inverse such that which if you add to a particular object gives you back the additive identity. All right? And finally, the addition should be commutative. So you need these properties in the addition. Apart from this, of course, this does not seem like much. It seems like, okay, anyway, uh, what is even the role of the field in all of this? Right? This is just like an abelian group. V and plus would have sufficed. But then you have this. You have this multiplication operation which takes an object from the field and an object from the, from the set of vectors that is V and maps it to another object in the set of V so that it is closed. The closure is a foregone conclusion. And what are the properties that this, what we call the scalar multiplication must satisfy? such that A, you must have. So of course, when you have the field, you have the multiplicative identity there, such that you pick up the multiplicative identity from the field, let it act on any vector, and it will give you back the same vector. So this is true of all vectors V that you can pluck out from the set of vectors called V the first property, all right? So you pick out this from the set of scalar, scalars or F, this from the set of vectors V. Please note that there is no point in talking about commutativity. The two objects are coming from two different sets. I mean, if you are just talking about commutativity as in alpha times V is equal to V times alpha, yeah, sure, that is there. But when you only talk about commutativity, it means you are picking out objects from the same set. Here you are not even doing that. So that is why we do not talk about commutativity of this operation separately. It does not make sense like that. But yeah, if you are saying 1 times V is V times 1, yeah, sure, that you can do. It is it's, again without any loss of generality, you can do that. There is no room for confusion over there. right? The second property, you take alpha and beta from the set of scalars and you do the scalar multiplication. It is the same as if you had taken alpha out 
and use the scalar multiplication with beta times v. So you see this is non trivial let us just say for all alpha beta coming from the field f and v coming from the set of vectors v. What does it mean? This is important. The operation that is happening here is not the scalar multiplication. This is the multiplication happening as defined in the field. Okay. I know this seems like it is trivial, it is obvious, there is nothing much to it. But remember this, it is important to observe that the way we are defining it, it is important to know that this is a property that we are invoking or imposing. It is not something that is very obvious. Every once in a while we might just think of these things as things in Euclidean spaces and tuples of numbers and we take it for granted. But this is an axiom of the vector space, it sort of tells you that this must be true. Okay. In other words, this operation being done in the field first and then the resultant being done a scalar, I mean if you perform a scalar multiplication with the resultant on a vector, it is the same as if you are done a step of, I mean two steps of, what is this? Scalar multiplications. First a scalar multiplications like so and then followed by another scalar multiplication like so. Okay. Now of course you know that in the field this commutes. So whether it is alpha, beta, beta, alpha matters not. right? So again this is again without any ambiguity. right? What is the third property? Any guesses? Whenever you have two operations, there must be some something that is there in the interplay of those two operations. So you must have distributivity. But you need two kinds of distributivity here it turns out. Which is to say that if you have what? Alpha plus beta times V, that should be equal to. So this is where the scalar multiplication comes in here. This addition is happening in the field. Right? It is important to note that. On the other hand, what is happening on the right hand side is, notice every operation here is the operation is in accordance with the operations that we have now defined. Here this operation is something that is already predefined for you. Right? This was the operation that is there in the field. This operation is the newly defined operation according to what we have said here. And this operation and this operation are also the scalar multiplications that we have defined here, we are defining here. This addition is the addition operation that we have defined here with respect to the set V. right? So this plus and this plus are different operations. This is adding two members in the field, this is adding two members in the set V. right? So that is an important distinction to make. At the same time, you have, okay, so let us say for all alpha, beta belonging to the field F and V belonging to V. And the fourth and final property is alpha times V1 plus V2. So again, here is the scalar multiplication, here is the vector addition. Both of these are the operations that we are defining here. And on the right hand side you have alpha acting on V1 plus alpha acting on V2 for all alpha in the field F and V1, V2 in the set of vectors. Okay? So if you have a field like so where and, and a set of vectors like so, so you have F v and two operations that meet all these conditions then we say the following that v f plus dot is a vector space. Okay. That is it. This allows us to address a whole bunch of problems that 
do not look anything like the ax is equal to b that we have seen so far in an analogous fashion okay note that when from the context this plus and multiplication this scalar multiplication and the vector addition are obvious or well understood we simply say b over f all right very straightforward example any field over itself is a vector space with the usual addition and multiplication defined on the field so any field over itself is a vector space please verify that i mean there's hardly anything to verify you just have to check that when you have these whether you have these properties with the addition and multiplication operation as defined in a field right you have more but all you require are these properties so any field over itself is a typical example of a vector space what else we can think of many so i'll give you a couple of examples now or rather maybe one example where suppose s is a set and f s comma f is a collection of functions from s to f right so that means this is the domain and it maps every object in s or some some objects in s to f that's what each member is right okay then you look at so this is a set all right so look at f s comma f over f of course i need to define what additions are what are those additions so you take f1 at some point s1 plus f2 at some point s1 is equal to f1 plus f2 okay so this is basically the opposite of the de definition so this is what i'm trying to define so this is defined in this manner this is the addition and the multiplication suppose i have defined as alpha times fs or rather alpha of f because this is what the multiplication operation is is just defined as the scalar alpha times fs1 okay yeah for all s1 belonging to s for all s1 belonging to s so that's why i'm defining the scalar multiplication and the vector addition okay and the moment i give you some more concrete examples of the set s perhaps things will be a little clear but we'll do that in the next module